excited to get on with our symposium and our next session is going to drill down on a more specific issue of appropriate use and misuse of benzodiazepines. Uh, benzodiazepines are uh, a common medication class used uh, to, to treat anxiety and, uh, and stress. Uh, and we do know that some patients get into some serious difficulties uh, with dependency uh, to these medications. Uh, we invited uh, two of our experts to discuss this issue with us today. Uh, I'll first introduce Dr. Elizabeth Archernanda. Uh, she's been an oncology nurse for 21 years and is board certified psychiatric clinical nurse specialist. She is the founding provider and program leader of the Norton Cancer Institute Behavioral Oncology Program. She received her Doctor of Nursing practice degree from Bellarmine University and her Master of Science in Nursing from the University of California. Also co-presenting is Dr. Kelly Cooper, who is our Medical Director of Addiction Medicine uh, in the Behavior Medicine Program at Norton Healthcare. Dr. Cooper has dedicated her career to addiction medicine and prior to joining Norton, worked in addiction services with various programs in Tennessee. Kelly is board certified in family medicine and preventive medicine, as well as uh, addiction medicine. She attended medical school at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She completed her internship in internal medicine and pediatrics at Maine Medical Center and a residency in family medicine at the University of Virginia, and also a residency in preventive medicine at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, Elizabeth, Kelly, we welcome you both. And I believe, Elizabeth, you're going first. Yes, sir. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Can you all see my screens here? Okay. I will assume you can. So um, thank you all for being here today. Uh, Dr. Cooper and I are going to talk a little bit about best practices and benzodiazepine use. Um, and we have some exciting kind of objectives today. Elizabeth, can you try uh -huh. on your screen share? I can. We see you, but not. Do you see it? Yeah, we do. Let's go full screen. There we go. Thank there. You. Okay, perfect. I could see it, but I guess it wasn't transmitting. So um, we have some exciting clinical objectives to discuss today, including uh, better understanding evidence-based approach to use of benzodiazepines. Uh, we're going to review some of the epidemiological concerns, including use and misuse of benzodiazepines, and briefly touching on stimulants, although um, in the spirit of being able to fully cover benzodiazepines, we will barely scratch the surface on stimulants. And then uh, reviewing the neurobiology and psychopharmacology of benzodiazepines, as well as an overview and assessment and tapering considerations with a case study. So I wanna start first with um, just kind of giving you this table of common benzodiazepines and sleep benzodiazepines, uh, better known as Z drugs. Um, I'm not gonna go through these in depth, but I do wanna start with a couple of myths and facts. Um, I think it's important to note that benzodiazepines, uh, it is a myth that they are first line treatment for anxiety or sleep, um, Rather, they can be used briefly to treat anxiety for two to four weeks. And what we know is that they may lose effectiveness in four to six weeks, and people are even um, at risk of some physiological dependency after use of benzos for four to six weeks and longer. Um, there is a common myth that Z drugs are totally safe. And in fact, they work similarly to benzodiazepines and also are not recommended for long-term use. They offer very little safety benefit beyond those um, initial weeks and can increase uh, risk for falls in older, older adults. Um, another fact about benzodiazepines is that they're the most commonly prescribed psychiatric medications with one in 20 people receiving a prescription in the United States each year. Um, and they're the third most commonly misused substance among adolescents um, and adults. So although they're classified as a Schedule IV medication, they do carry a really high risk of abuse, dependence, and misuse. Um, Dr. Cooper will go into the pharmacology of these medications later in the presentation, um, helping us to better understand why that, why that is. 
So let's talk about some common uses for benzodiazepines. Um, as mentioned earlier, they are commonly used in anxiety disorders. Um, they're often used in schizophrenia, bipolar disorder. They're used to treat psychiatric symptoms, including anxiety and insomnia. Um, and sometimes we use them to treat agitation and aggression. A really important use that has been uh, better studied in recent years is the use of benzodiazepines in catatonia can be life-saving and important to assess and understand um, patients experiencing a catatonic state to use those appropriately. And of course, non-psychiatric uses include um, use as an anticonvulsant, muscle relaxants, helping with vertigo, um, sedative. And then again, looking at their really important utility in alcohol and benzodiazepine withdrawal, both which can be life-threatening states. Um, sometimes we use benzodiazepines to help with psychotropic adverse effects, including akesthesia, which is an incredibly um, distressing psychiatric um, symptom that can be experienced with, as an adverse effect of certain medications. So um, anxiety disorders are really common. I think we know that, and um, they affect up to 40 million adults with a 30% lifetime prevalence. They can um, be common symptoms of other psychiatric illnesses, including major depression. And um, there's some back and forth uh, study around their use as a first line treatment for insomnia. I've, I've read conflicting reports in the literature, um, but again, I think noting that they can have utility in insomnia, but again, looking at utilizing them for under four weeks. Um, Benzodiazepines are actually not normally, we talked about this myth earlier, they're not typically the first line use for um, anxiety, rather SSRIs and SNRIs are first line. And so sometimes you can use a benzodiazepine, but using it as a bridge is an appropriate use of that medication. So there are a lot of um, pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic interventions that are used to treat anxiety beyond benzodiazepines. Um, it's, it's really important. I loved what Dr. Pendleton said earlier, prescribe the community. It's really important to get patients connected to health resources, social support symptom systems, um, and other medication interventions and types of therapy um, that aren't benzodiazepine related um, to help patients with anxiety disorders and other psychiatric sequela. So let's talk a little bit about some um, evidence-based principles of prescribing. So I think it's important to note that benzodiazepines have been studied as a drug that are safe in populations for use somewhere around two to four weeks. We actually don't have a lot of information beyond two to four weeks and how benzodiazepines impact our physiology and um, can kind of further alter um, or disinhibit a person or place them at risk for other um, psychiatric illnesses or even suicide. So I think it's really important to look at the risks and benefits, um, including is there a situation where this person needs some quick benefit and symptom relief but how do we weigh out that against the risks? So is this person a person with a history of um, abuse concerns, dependence concerns, any previous substance use concerns? Um, are there problematic areas of concern looking at diversion or misuse? Um, how are we using our statewide reporting systems like CASPER and INSPECT to better understand, does this patient have multiple prescribers? Um, and are they at risk for other concerns or harmful effects such as falls, accidents? Um, the, the jury is out on the impact of benzodiazepines long-term over cognitive challenges, but certainly a person who's at risk for cognitive decline or cognitive challenge, maybe they aren't the right person to utilize a benzodiazepine within. Um, we do know that there are a lot of drug-associated hospital admissions um, that go up in the context of benzodiazepine use. So weighing that is one of the potential risks. Um, in order to maximize risks uh, or maximize outcomes and minimize risks rather, you always wanna use the shortest duration of the medication with the lowest dosage to get relief from that symptom. Um, again, taken two to four weeks or less and 
reducing any prolonged use to allow for limitations to tolerance and dependence. Um, there are often extenuating circumstances where use of these medications are important um, and helpful, including the diagnosis of a terminal illness um, and an acute grief experience. I was really struck when Dr. Taylor talked earlier today at the challenge that we're facing across the healthcare system, looking at the impact of the COVID-19 um, experience across not only our own healthcare system, but also the patients coming into our clinics and those grief rituals not being able to be experienced by patients and families, the impact to that, and then how we as providers naturally want to give patients and their families relief. Um, and so sometimes looking to solutions, um, but making sure that we're weighing out those risks before we add something on that could layer and provide some additional harm. So again, you're gonna to want to thoroughly um, evaluate if the patient has any history of comorbid alcohol or substance use disorders um, and really avoiding use of benzodiazepines in those high risk populations. Again, with the exception of someone in acute alcohol withdrawal, um, use of benzodiazepines would be within the standard of care and evidence-based. Um, it's important to note when an individual has a history of a substance use disorder and using appropriate DSM-5 um, diagnostic criteria and listing that in the problem, use, problem list under substance use disorder would be the appropriate listing on the problem list to alert other providers and clinicians across the healthcare team um, for an individual who might be high risk for use um, while on a benzodiazepine. Um, I think we know that benzodiazepines and Z drugs are both on the high risk medication list um, within the beers criteria for elderly um, and even though co-prescribing of opioids and benzodiazepine is not recommended, um, it actually is commonly seen within clinical practice. And we'll get into some of the Norton Healthcare data here a little bit in a little bit. Um, anxiety disorders can be reduced in the short term. There's limited evidence of use of benzodiazepines in individuals with post-traumatic stress, obsessive compulsive disorder, um, and individuals who have high risk for um, personality challenges, you can actually see some mood dysregulation and worsening of personality um, characteristic and factors when we add benzodiazepines in the mix. So being aware of that and really cautious. Um, and we should note that benzodiazepines carry a heightened risk for mortality. So looking a little bit more, um, I think this grid is helpful just for you to have in a handout perspective that individuals, um, patient groups that we really should avoid benzodiazepine risks um, or benzodiazepine use within, and you can see them listed out there um, in this table for your, for your keeping. So I really felt like this was a really nice timeline of the, the kind of bringing the market of benzodiazepines and their introduction. So they were first marketed and, um, and discovered in the 1960s. Um, Hoffman LaRoche was a chemist, um, was a group that employed a chemist, Leo Sternbach, and he found the first benzodiazepine Librium um, noted their benefits and they were certainly safer than barbiturates, which had been on the market previous and pulled because of their high risk for suicide. Um, and so by 1963, diazepam was on the market. And in 1970, benzos topped the prescribing list as the most prescribed medications um, out there. It wasn't really until 1975 when we began to better understand their mechanism of action. Um, and we began to really understand some of the risks associated with um, benzodiazepine use. So concerns continue to rise throughout the 1980s, better understanding that individuals using benzodiazepines would be potentially at greater risk for abuse and dependence. And in 1990 was when the APA launched a task force to begin investigating the dangers of benzodiazepines. Now, 1990 seems long ago, um, but it really wasn't. And we're still really young in our journey of understanding the long-term implications of benzodiazepine use. Um, I attended a lecture just the other day that Dr. Cooper shared with me. And they talked about what we know about the safety of benzodiazepine is really limited to those first four weeks. 
And um, so any use beyond that, it's, it's a little bit of an unknown territory and has not been well studied. Um, I was impressed the researchers talked a little bit about um, just sort of not really even being able to fully understand the mechanism of what made them so um, risky. And so they've sort of thrown their hands and not even continued down that pursuit of um, study and better understanding. So by 1996, 4.1% of the adult per population was receiving a prescription for a benzodiazepine. By 2013, 5.6% of the population. And by 2017, what we know is that 85% of overdose deaths involved a benzodiazepine and an opioid. I thought that was fun. It topped the prescribing list. So these um, old, I guess, advertisements for uh, benzodiazepines, I think that this kind of further explains the love-hate relationship that was in the making. So the first, one of the first benzos was advertised saying, now she can cope or reduce psychic tension with uh, Valium. Um, I don't know if you can see this lady with her cart. It says, you can't set her free, but you can help her to feel less anxious. anxious. Um, Librium is an escape to reality. And then of course here in 2017, I think this was published. Um, now we're in a benzodiazepine crisis as people who want to extend good help. Um, sometimes we have extended good help through the form of a pill without meaning to intend harm and certainly not wanting to have harm occur, um, but harm has occurred nonetheless. So again, benzodiazepine deaths grew by 400% from 1996 to 2013. ED visits increased by 300% when a benzodiazepine was involved from 2004 to 2011. And in 2017, benzos and other tranquilizers were the most third most commonly used illicit prescription drug. Um, interestingly, prescribing data between 2004 and 2011, I believe it was, Alprazolam stayed at the number four drug prescribed for the, that seven year period. The others shifted with opioids kind of topping the chart in that period, but only Alprazolam has stayed the course and stayed a highly prescribed medication. So over death rates have continued to climb. 700,000 Americans have died from overdose deaths. Um, in 2019, and overall drug overdose deaths rose from 2018 to 2019. Um, uh, deaths also rose, including stimulants and opioids, um, and deaths involving uh, opioids declined from 2012 to 2018, but they unfortunately went back up in 2019. Here's just some more data for you to have um, involving benzodiazepine and stimulant-related deaths. And then I wanna switch into talking about what is misuse. So taken at a frequency or dose higher than prescribed or without a prescription is the definition of misuse. Individuals um, getting their benzodiazepines from a primary source without a prescription typically include family and friends. And the prevalence of misuse is only about 2%. However, it continues to grow in individuals with psychiatric conditions. Um, it grows in individuals with a lifetime history of substance use and alcohol use disorders and um, really peaks in individuals with a history of opioid use disorders. So I think one of the big things that we need to remember as we prescribe these medications is prescribing with a lot of psychoeducation around the risk benefit ratio and having a mindful discussion with patients um, if they're at risk. We talked a little bit earlier about the importance of listing a substance use disorder diagnosis for individuals. Um, substance use disorders, um, as you can see here, it's broken out into loss of control and physiology, which includes tolerance and withdrawal. That was formally known as dependence. These all fall now under substance use disorder criteria in the DSM-5 psychiatric manual. Um, consequences of loss of control and physiology used to be abuse. Um, again, all now combined. So a substance use disorder is defined by anyone in having two or more of these um, different uh, difficulties. Tolerance and withdrawal alone don't imply a disorder 
um, really tolerance and withdrawal aren't the only things. And a person who goes to really significant um, places to try to gain control or gain um, access to that medication, that's when you're looking at someone who is really more at high risk for um, um, a use disorder. Severity is rated by the number of symptoms present. So it can be mild, uh, two to three symptoms, moderate, four to five of these, um, and severe with six or more of these challenges. I wanna shift the next couple of minutes into some Norton healthcare related um, activities going on through the substance um, controlled substance task force. So Norton has over the last several years looked at high use of opioids. We're now shifting into looking at some prescribing data around uh, benzodiazepine use. So I think it's really interesting among individuals with active benzo prescriptions, 38.5% percent of those people have prescriptions for longer than 31 days. Um, and again, we've talked about two to four weeks being that lower risk period. Um, and then individuals with concurrent and active, more than one active benzodiazepine, um, I'm sorry, patients with current active benzodiazepine prescriptions is right around 20%. Patients with an active benzodiazepine and opioid prescription in 2021, was around 19%. And then individuals 65 and older within Norton Healthcare who have a benzodiazepine prescription is around 38%. So certainly continuing to modify and look at individuals at high risk. Some other important uh, Norton Healthcare interventions and initiatives to know, um, Dr. Ryan Stewart's a physician epic builder who has helped with building some smart phrases and also um, some templates that will be coming for use within the Norton system. So what we'll see coming soon is a benzodiazepine treatment plan, a benzodiazepine visit where we can do monitoring and specific questioning around that benzodiazepine use, um, and then benzodiazepine specific notes. I just put some screenshots in there for you so you have um, kind of a picture of what these are and, and how you might utilize them. Um, some additional um, EPIC enhancements include changes to the Metaspan dosing defaults. Um, there's a lot of different favorite lists in EPIC. Um, and what I found when I was doing some kind of historical look at the EMR and how we've been using it at Norton, um, there have been some really high prescription amounts around not only the dosage of the benzodiazepine, but also the frequency, the number of pills, and the number of refills. So for instance, lorazepam, one of the defaults in EPIC historically had been two milligrams every six hours. Um, you would get 90 tablets and two refills automatically. That would be one of the favorite lists that would first default in EPIC. And so through just probably ease of process of clicking buttons or maybe not being familiar with prescribing and benzodiazepine often, I think it's natural to pull from that favorite list, um, placing a little bit higher risk that a patient's not only getting a higher milligram prescription with a higher number of pills and then more refills, um, then just naturally linking to some risks for abuse and dependence of that medication. Um, or not even abuse, but certainly becoming at risk for dependence and maybe misusing the medication. Um, this is actively being worked on by the EPIC team. April Strickler and Diane Simmons um, are working on that very closely and hopefully we'll have updates with that to come soon. Um, some future EPIC enhancements include looking at some best practice safety advisory alerts. Um, so a patient who's on a benzodiazepine and an opioid, perhaps a BSA would, um, fire when patients are on that med combo that would say, this patient's on a benzodiazepine and an opioid pain medication, can you consider revising therapy? Um, ensuring that CASPERS and INSPECs have been looked at, looking at urine drug screens. Those are additional best practice advisory alerts that will in the future sometime fire. And I know that those become burdensome when we get a lot of them, but I do think top of mind um, and looking from a systems perspective where we have some opportunity to improve some of our longer term prescribing of these medications can be important. 
I think um, one of the big things that is I'm hopeful can come from this is not stopping prescribing benzodiazepines, but thinking a little bit before benzodiazepine becomes the easy prescription to prescribe. And then also looking at if we've prescribed a person and we've given good education around using it in the short term, then what are other alternatives that we're bridging them to for longer term benefit and reducing some of those risks with longer term use of the medication? Um, the Controlled Substance Task Force is also looking at ways in which we can create um, diazepam equivalencies. Currently, we track opioids through looking at morphine equivalencies. We're going to do a similar thing with diazepam equivalencies to better understand our prescribing um, at baseline and then areas and opportunities for improvement. Um, and there's going to be some similar work occurring with stimulants. So um, with that, I'm really excited to uh, pass this over to my my good colleague and friend, Dr. Cooper, and I'm going to end my slide so, show so that she can share hers. All right. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, Dr. Archernanda. That was an excellent presentation, and I am excited to pick up. Um, let me just share my screen here. Okay, can you see the screen? We can. Okay, great. Thank you. It's good. All right. So um, our hope in uh, discussing benzos today is to um, increase your comfort level and your skill level in addressing benzo use and benzo misuse in your patients and feeling comfortable or at least more comfortable about tapering them off of benzos um, when that is indicated or clinically appropriate. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about those pieces. Uh, first, I wanna just briefly, very briefly touch on the neurobiology and pharmacology of benzos in a very, very oversimplistic way. But uh, so, Benzodiazepines act as an agonist at the benzo receptor, which is specifically at the GABA-A receptor, and it causes a hyperpolarization of, uh, uh, to prolong the postsynaptic membrane, and that means that that neuron is much less likely to fire in the brain. Um, it enhances, so benzos enhance the effect of GABA by doing this, and what happens is it makes this receptor, which is the postsynaptic neuron, less responsive to any type of excitatory stimuli. And this also occurs um, through a very similar fashion with the Z drugs that um, Dr. Arjunanda just talked about. Um, and, and really, they're in the central nervous system, there's a balance. Everything, everything in the body is a balance act, right? And the same thing in the central nervous system, there's excitatory stim stimuli or neurotransmitters, and then there's inhibitory ones. And in order thing to, things for everything to function properly, this balance uh, should, needs to be intact. In the brain, specifically, it's GABA, neurotransmitter and the glutamate neurotransmitter. So GABA is actually the inhibitory neurotransmitter. So what it does, it's, it's like the red, it's the red light on the stoplight. It slows things down. The glutamate on the other hand is the go button. It is the excitatory uh, neurotransmitter. And, um, but the GABA actually causes a very slowing, tranquilizing, less uh, neuronal response in the brain. So what we see, and just to also say, so when, when GABA gets, um, so if somebody's on a benzodiazepine and then all of a sudden that stops, then the excitatory neurotransmitters start ramping up very quickly because the system is so out of balance. And that's where you can also see um, uh, hyperstimulation in the brain, and that can cause seizures, et cetera, and some very uh, serious consequences uh, when somebody is suddenly stopped um, on a benzodiazepine after they, their brain is used to seeing that for a very long time and potentially in large doses. 
So let me uh, talk about related problems that we know happen with benzodiazepines. Um, I will say coming from the addiction side of things that most people, um, most people do not, are not addicted to benzodiazepines. I've seen many people addicted to benzodiazepines because I'm in that subset of, of the field, but I would say in general, most people are not addicted. They are physiologically dependent, however, and that we have to acknowledge that um, and we have to understand how that is gonna translate uh, in their care. Uh, so other problems include sedation, dizziness, vertigo, fatigue. Uh, this is just, this is patients just being on benzos. This is not, I'm not saying, uh, talking about taking benzos away. This is, benzos can actually cause all of this. So discognition, confusion, amnesia, dementia in long-term use, um, psychomotor impairments such as incoordination and ataxia, slurred speech and others, disinhibition, uh, including irritability, aggression, hostility, uh, impulsivity, and sometimes even violence can happen. Um, adverse mood, uh, including worsening anxiety, um, sometimes emotional blunting, uh, uh, mania, depression, even suicidality, and like we already touched upon, tolerance, dependence, um, intoxication with acute uh, high dose use, um, and then addiction is also a possibility. Um, and then withdrawal for patients who um, who uh, who are on it more long term and who have a sudden decreased dose or uh, discontinuation of the benzodiazepine. Um, and like Dr. Arthur Nanda said, there's also um, a risk of respiratory depression and overdose and potentially death, especially in combination with opioid use. So I want to um, kind of illustrate uh, my talk with a case, uh, and this is a case from Norton, and um, and I think that there's a lot of uh, complex patients that you all have out there that um, you know, and I hear I hear a lot about many of them, not all of them, but some of them, and um, I kind of understand the 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 challenges that you're all dealing with, especially with controlled substances and whether you're inheriting patients or you're trying to make the best of a situation and you're trying to help somebody, but at the same time, um, you know, we wanna fill your toolbox with ways to <clears throat> try to evaluate and help the patient, but also help yourself in terms of how to manage these patients. So here's a case of a 73 year old female. She was on one milligram of Xanax uh, three times a day for 20 years for anxiety and sleep. She was also on hydrocodone 7.5 milligrams four times a day for uh, 14 years. Her medical history is uh, positive for remote um, lung cancer who's, who's in, um, in remission, uh, hypertension. She had a chron chronic uh, carotid artery occlusion on the left side. She had chronic back pain with degenerative disc disease, uh, osteoarthritis in the knees and shoulders. For that is why she was re receiving the opioids um, and she was also getting steroid shots intermittently. She has a history of uh, sleep apnea, uh, GERD, stage three uh, uh, CKD. She does have um, some cognitive or memory impairment. She did have a brain aneurysm uh, probably about five to 10 years ago. And she does smoke on occasion. Uh, she, her psych history is positive for depression and complicated grief due to a, a loss um, in her family. Uh, and then uh, she, in terms of her substance use, she denies any uh, other substance use. She denies ever trying to decrease or taper her benzo. And so we do not know if, it, so there was no seizure history or complicated withdrawal issues around the benzo that we knew of at this point. Her meds, she's on amlodipine and aspirin and PPI, uh, in addition to the uh, other two controlled substances that I mentioned. And she's a domestic of, uh, she's a victim of domestic violence um, 20 years ago, which is why she was started on the benzo. She now lives with her daughter and son-in-law and their daughter. Uh, she lives kind of in an upstairs apartment, but they spend quite a bit of time together. 
She was recently dismissed from a practice uh, from a primary care provider for unknown reasons. She transferred to a nurse practitioner here at Norton. Um, and she was very concerned, the nurse practitioner was very concerned about the, the concomitant use of opioids and benzos in a patient her, her, of her age. So she was referred to, um, to us in behavioral health to, to discuss a benzo taper. Uh, and in the meantime, the nurse practitioner had a discussion about the risks uh, of benzos. Uh, they got a, a urine drug screen on her. She actually tested negative for benzos, but she's tested positive for her opiates. Um, she, was, uh, she was told to decrease her benzo dose from three milligrams a day to 1.5 milligrams a day, which is a dose reduction of 50%. Um, and so I wanted to talk about uh, indications for uh, considering to taper or discontinue benzos in patients. So here are the indications, uh, loss of effectiveness. And, and I put the RMB as risks and benefits. And you know I am always talking to patients about risks and benefits. And I think anytime a controlled substance gets in the mix with a patient as a potential uh, for, for use or prescribing, we always have to talk with the patients, not just when we start a patient on something about the risks and the benefits, but you know, what are the risks and benefits of continuing this, um, this controlled substance? So uh, that's very important. Uh, are there any adverse reactions or events that are occurring because or in, in uh, concert with the benzodiazepine? Um, have, has a patient used it for more than four weeks is a good indication that we should probably stop it. Um, uh, and then it, sometimes it's the patient's preference, they wanna get off of it. Uh, are there co other co-occurring conditions, especially so, uh, co-occurring uh, mental health issue like depression? Uh, and are, is the patient taking very high doses of a benzo that again, increases the risks? Uh, also concurrent use of opioids increases the risk, age increases risk. Are they taking multiple diaz diaz uh, uh, benzos at the same time? Um, are they also using other illicit drugs that can incre increase risk? And uh, is there any alcohol use and how much alcohol use? And does a patient have actually an alcohol use disorder, which again um, can, uh, can lead to um, overdose issues? Uh, do they have a benzo uh, use disorder? Um, and have they ever overdosed on benzos before? Um, or are they at risk for that? So those are some tapering considerations. And as you think about tapering a patient um, off of benzos, uh, you want to assess what benzo they're on, what's the dose they're on, what's the frequency they're on, how long have they been using that, what are the comorbidities associated uh, you know, with their conditions, and uh, what's the history um, around uh, any taper in the past or discontinuation of benzos. And, I, and that's very important because if they have, if they have had a history of seizures or life-threatening uh, uh, adverse reactions coming off of benzos or tapering benzos, then it's probably safer for them to be in an inpatient or a detox type setting, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, you can also taper people and put them on um, uh, you know, another uh, anticonvulsant to, uh, to um, minimize the risk of seizures. So, uh, but it is important to understand that there are options, not just the outpatient option uh, for tapering or discontinuing benzos in a very high risk person. Uh, so that needs to be assessed. And then really develop a plan with a patient. It's important the patient gets buy-in um, to the best extent possible with why, why, why the taper is important and what that taper is gonna look like. So at least a third of patients, and I'll say this is, it's probably quite a bit higher than that, will have significant withdrawal side effects during the taper. And so you have to consider additional supportive medications for their mood, for their anxiety, for their insomnia, for central nervous system, uh, system uh, symptoms. Um, some examples of that are clonidine, um, trazodone for sleep, uh, and then SSRI, SNRI, um, or hydroxazine uh, are some of the things that I use. In addition to the non uh, to the pharmacological pieces of this, uh, we also want to. It's very important for patients to get 
support around the taper because it is going to be challenging. It's not challenging for every patient, but it's challenging for most patients. Um, and supportive therapy and counseling, specifically CBT to enhance and support their coping skills for the taper is very, very critical. And it's clear that patients do better with the support of CBT during this process. Um, they also need other support. They need your support and they need validation and kind of some coaching from you as a, as a prescriber and your staff. Um, I generally do very close follow-up with these patients because if something's not working or, um, uh, you know, I don't want them to fail the taper um, or stop or, you know, there be to, there to be such a major mishap and I, and I don't hear about it. So I tend to do very close follow-up with these patients. And then I try to, if you can, enlist family or friends or any support people to really, uh, to help with their coping skills at home. Uh, promote healthy activities, and again, edu educate the patient as, as best as you can. Um, and I will also allow the, the patient to help drive the taper at points, because if they're really struggling for various reasons, we may stop or slow it down for a brief period of time and then pick it back up again, um, because it, it does take a while. And I will say that there are, there, is, there are some people that will not be able to discontinue benzos, um, which is very unfortunate, but um, that is the case. So let me talk a little bit more about tapering. It's a very slow process. Um, and, uh, and so you really, depending, again, depending on what they're on, depending on how long they've been on it, depending on their motivation to get off of it, how they tolerate the taper, et cetera. Um, generally, it's a very slow taper that takes about 12 to 18 months. So uh, patients and prescribers are in it for the long haul. It's not, it's generally not a very fast process. Um, so I would consider switching to, a, if a patient's on a short acting benzo, I would consider switching them to a longer acting benzo like clonopin or diazepam. Um, lorazepam, although it's a shorter, it's a shorter to intermediate acting benzo, that is the one that is recommended for patients uh, over 65 because it uh, does not does not have metabolites that accumulate, and it's um, it's not hepatically metabolized, so that is a bit safer in that population. Um, and then, as far as the taper goes, no more than ten percent per day or twenty five percent per week in terms of the dose decrease. Generally, the rule of thumb is about ten percent per week is what you're shooting for. And then when you get to the lat, the, towards the end of the taper and the last 25% of the dose, you wanna extend that out for, for longer um, because that uh, people struggle most coming off uh, at the very end of the taper. Uh, and then these are just uh, withdrawal, um, diazepam withdrawal effects generally occur five to seven days after discontinuation. And then um, Xanax or Alprazolam is about two to three days. This is just an example of a slow taper with diazepam at 40 milligrams a day. Um, and I just wanna point out that, so this is a BID dosing. And basically there's a decrease of every week at about 10%. So 10%, if you're going a bit more than 10%, so this is up to 14 or 17% here, that is over a two week period instead of a one week period. So again, between 10 and 20% or so um, week, every week to every other week. Um, and then uh, as it, you can see that the dose decreases uh, are pretty consistent in the AM PM doses, except um, as you get here, uh, and, and I've jumped ahead up to the 28th week here. Again, these are, now it becomes more of a two week uh, taper instead of a one week taper. And again, and you're up to about 20 to 30 ish percent of a dose decrease um, just because of uh, the, you know, the, the very small, that you're kind of into more micro dosing now. Um, and as you notice, the last one we're gonna pull off is the PM dose. It's the AM and the other doses that are gonna come out first. If somebody has TID dosing, I generally take out the middle dose first. Um, and the PM dose, I'm, I'm gonna leave for last, and then I'll take off the AM dose. 
And I talked briefly about microdosing. This is this is kind of another hot topic in tapering people off of controlled substances. Um, generally, I use have the patient get a pill splitter, and they're cutting up um, cutting up the pills usually into quarters. And I'll tell them, you know, very clearly what they need to take um, each week. Uh, the other thing that is also occurring now is to do this uh, a little bit easier. Uh, meaning easier for the brain to handle is uh, dissolving um, the uh, the benzo in water, 100 cc's of water, and discarding like a milligram a day. So every day they're just going down one cc, uh, and that that's gaining popularity now. So I'm going to go back to the case. Uh, so I saw this patient um, when she came to me. She was in. She was complaining of withdrawal symptoms, worsening anxiety, insomnia, worsening of her pain because she went down on the benzo from three milligrams to 1.5. She she and her daughter state stated emphatically that they were taking 2.5 milligrams. Uh, uh, of the Xanax instead of the 1.5 because of the, uh, the withdrawal symptoms that they said were happening. And so she, she needs a refill at this point. So we planned a slower taper with the patient, again, about 10% per week. So let me talk a little bit about benzo withdrawal. Uh, so you will see in patients that you're tapering, they will have withdrawal symptoms that include depression, worsening, anxiety, sometimes very severe anxiety and panic attacks, uh, hypersensory perceptions, uh, impaired cognition, memory, sometimes confusion, heart palpitations, sweating, uh, paresthesias, muscle twitching and cramping, including legs. Uh, some in extreme situations, people could have a seizure, uh, nausea, uh, tremors, insomnia, uh, and sometimes people will have a very protracted withdrawal that can actually last for years. And I think, you know, I, this is important because, as you, again, as you think about initiating patients on benzos and especially long-term benzos, you have to think about these patients will be in withdrawal if their dose decreases or if it's discontinued for any reason. And um, benzo withdrawal is, can be very serious and life-threatening and not just life-threatening, but these are extremely uncomfortable withdrawal symptoms um, that patients have. So challenges to um, addressing the withdrawal issues in patients is the withdrawal is worse in patients who are on higher daily doses. It's, with, it's worse in patients who are on benzos that have short half-lives, specifically Xanax. Um, and then uh, the longer they've used the benzo, uh, the, the harder it is to, uh, to taper and the more withdrawal challenges they may have. Um, if you're rapidly going to taper somebody, um, the withdrawal will be much, much more difficult for the patient. Uh, and then um, any mental health issues, panic disorders, anxiety, depressions, that could all get much worse um, when somebody's in withdrawal. And then any concomitant substance use uh, or, or alcohol use can um, create uh, a lot more challenges with withdrawal and tapering. And here's the dosing for anticonvulsants um, for two to three weeks um, after initiating a uh, 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 tapering. Uh, you can do longer than that, but this is for seizure pr prevention. So carbamazepine 200 TID or Valproate 250 TID. Um, this is something that um, many people don't know about it. Uh, and I think it's important, especially for primary care providers to understand that people on benzos, there are interactions that actually can uh, affect the effectiveness of uh, or the potency of benzos. And these include um, PPIs. So PPIs utilize the same uh, P450 pathway as benzos. Uh, so they're actually, PPIs actually increase, increase, uh, that increase the effect of benzodiazepines. Um, and this is an example in our patient who um, was on PPIs for her GERD. Um, you know, she was on a specific dose, but uh, her brain is probably seeing uh, a higher level than what she was on. Um, and then you, you can consider dose adjustment 
um, for those patients for in lorazepam or axazepam, which is not metabolized by the liver. Uh, acute alcohol abuse is also uh, a P450 inhibitor, as is the PPIs. So um, that will affect, increase the benzo effect as well. And fluoroquinolones actually block benzodiazepines from binding. So uh, sometimes you will actually see patients on a, a benzo and a fluoroquinolone um, actually have withdrawal symptoms because they were placed on the fluoroquinolone. So keep those in mind. How do you work with a patient in this challenging situation? I always tell patients, this is, it's a marathon, not a sprint. This isn't, you know, this, this didn't happen overnight and it's not going to be solved overnight. In fact, it is, it, you're in it for the long haul. We'll just, we just keep plugging away at it week after week. Um, so be honest with the patient, be supportive, express your concerns, and, but also listen to their concerns as well. Um, it's important the patient is educated as to, you know, the risks and the benefits and the whys and the plan. Uh, prescribing plus accountability for controlled substances. I always say trust but verify, and I talk to patients about this at length, that you know, I, I hear what they're saying and I trust what they're saying, but I have to verify what they're saying by a, a, you know, objective data. And that includes urine drug screens, and call, it includes potentially pill counts, um, and, you know, having a patient agreement or a patient contract in place so that the patient knows exactly what the rules are of me prescribing a, subs a controlled substance to them and, you know, and the accountability that comes with that for the patient. Um, yes, you know, pa patient agreements and contracts can be broken. Uh, by the patient if they quote unquote fail a urine drug screen, but the goal is for you to help them get to where, you know, where they need to be uh, clinically. And um, I don't use these as punitive. Again, I use them to verify exactly where the patient is. And we have to be honest about where the patient is. And those are the conversations that I have with the patient. Um, so I do urine drug screens very, very frequently, at least monthly on patients. I don't refill, refill any prescribed, any controlled substances outside of uh, visits with me. And then um, I, I can also do pill counts. So if you think a patient is not taking their medicine appropriately, then you can call them into the office for a pill count um, to count their pills and see how much they have. So uh, I'm gonna go back to the case. So this is what happened. So seven, she, she came in for the intake. She was saying that she ran out of Xanax and she needs refills. So she's accompanied by her daughter who does most of the talking and the patient just generally agrees with what the daughter's saying. Uh, and so I checked Casper and um, the patient consistently got early refills on her Xanax, which was a bit of a red flag for me. Uh, she reported taking 2.5 milligrams a day. But when I calculated out the day she, the prescription was filled to the day I saw the patient, it didn't add up. So it added up that the patient was actually taking 3.75 milligrams a day instead of the reported 2.5 milligrams a day. So it took me a while to do, uh, to uh, talk with the patient and the daughter about the, how this doesn't make sense. And um, so I said, I need to know exactly how much she's taking and she had a previous negative urine drug screen for benzo. So what is going on? So we reviewed how she was taking her medications and her daughter puts her, um, her pills in a pill box for the patient um, every seven days. Uh, and then her mom takes the pills. So she doesn't oversee the pill taking. She just, she uh, puts it out every seven days. Uh, she has, uh, she denied, emphatically denied sharing any medic medications or any of the Xanaxes, giving them to anybody else, taking them because both the daughter and son-in-law are also on Xanax in the house. And then the Xanax is in a lockbox and only the daughter and the son-in-law have access to it. The daughter, um, so I, I said, there are some, there are pills unaccounted for if you need a refill right now. And so the the daughter went and she found extra pills in her mom's garbage can. 
Uh, and she said she, I think she got confused and she threw him out because she thought it was her Wellbutrin, which she didn't want to take anymore. So I think she threw those pills out. She, daughter said she took, she saw her taking her Xanax about two days ago um, and felt that she was taking it, um, but she didn't know if it was every day or how often. So uh, we talked about very at, at length about risks and benefits in the patient with the patient, but I want to go over those with you right now. So the patient in terms of risk, her age is, she's 73, so her age is a risk factor for complications and problems with benzos. She's on concurrent opioids. She's got sleep apnea. She's on a PPI. She's got cognitive impairment. She's got a mental health issue as in depression, not just her anxiety. Um, is she having some adverse reaction to the benzo itself that is also causing depression, cognitive impairment, et cetera. Um, very difficult to um, evaluate the patient and the missing pill issue, what is going on with that. Uh, you know, the, the dosing is very unclear. Uh, she's getting early refills. Um, she's had an abnormal urine drug screen uh, despite stability. Uh, in the report that the patient and the daughter is giving uh, around the benzo. Uh, and then, um, so the, the question that I had for this patient is, is there a concern for diversion? Um, so that was definitely on my radar with this patient. Um, are other persons using these? And I specifically asked uh, about that with the patient and the daughter. And of course they said no. Um, so the plan was to continue a slow taper. Um, increase of visits. I was seeing this patient weekly uh, with urine drug screens. I also made sure she had naloxone or Narcan uh, just in case there was an overdose situation. Discussed the risks, um, including falls, cognition, dementia issues, worsening cognition, uh, over sedation, et cetera. Um, so she followed up for two weeks. We continued the slow taper. She was tolerating it well. Her urine drug screens were appropriate. And then all of a sudden she fell out of care. And about three weeks after that, she, uh, she was in the ER um, in the hospital with a, a femur fracture and re that required surgery. Um, the daughter uh, had called and stating, the primary care doctor stating that she needs a refill of her Xanax. Um, she's now on one milligram. Um, after getting out of the hospital, but uh, her Xanax was lost in the hospital when she went to the hospital, uh, so she needs more. Um, and then uh, the PCP noted that urine drug screens actually were negative for benzos, so no prescription was given anymore for benzos. Uh, the, the daughter asked for clonopin instead, that was refused, and the daughter called um, behavioral, me and behavioral health to get more Xanax prescribed to get her to her pain doctor. Um, and then we would not refill her Xanax as well. Um, and then things became a little belligerent uh, at the dot, and then they wound up changing primary care sites. So, um, you know, I know that there's a lot of challenging issues and challenging patients out there. Um, uh, you know, hopefully it's more of a minority. Um, and I know that benzos or controlled substances can create a lot of challenges and even more challenges in the day to day. But um, I just wanna talk about a few uh, takeaways with this case and just have a clear understanding of who, what, and why you're treating and prescribing. Um, anxiety, stress, and worry are normal and coping skills, improving, uh, improving coping skills and support and CBT are very essential to that. And um, when you initiate a benzo, Consider it in a low risk patient for a very short term only um, because there are so many complications that can come from that use. Uh, and then accountability uh, with patient contracts, urine drug screens, uh, pill counts, making sure you're look or, looking at Casper and Inspect and address and understand the risk in our patients. Those details matter and it took a long time to get out kind of what's going on with that patient. But you know that patient, I'm quite sure there was a lot of diversion going on uh, with her Xanax. Uh, and then make sure that you prescribe nalo naloxone and Narcan for patients also on opioids. For tapering, it's important to set expectations and go slow. It takes, it, patience is the key. 
and really using other people and your co colleagues, including us in uh, addiction medicine, psychiatry, be behavioral health, um, pain management, other specialists, so that we can help you manage these patients. It takes a lot of time and resources and expertise to kind of peel back the onion, um, create that accountability and work together to, to help these patients get better. And it's important to include the patient in, in, in goal setting as well. Oops. Awesome. Those are my. And, and we're running a little short on time. Yep. Um, I, I did have one question slash comment. I remember back in the 80s when Xanax came out, it was marketed as the first non-addictive benzodiazepine that also treats depression. And it was marketed at all the annual meetings and big psychiatric meetings for a long time because they kept making the point, well, people don't get addicted to it because they don't escalate their dosing. So it didn't re meet criteria for addiction. And I would emphasize that to the audience. I think you made a great point about that, that it's, uh, they're physically dependent. And the words we use are really important because uh, as soon as I try to bring it up, particularly with geriatric patients, they immediately rebel the idea that they have an addiction. And uh, again, not vernacular that we would use, but when you explain that it's a physical dependency and how the brain is responding to long-term use of these medications and the dangers of just abruptly stopping, um, you know, it takes you down a different pathway for most folks who are trying to be reasonable that this is uh, the right thing to do. But any final comments, Dr. Cooper? Or Yeah, I'll just say that, you know, I, I, I try to get people off a lot of substances um, and I will say that benzos are the most challenging. I can, it's, it's much easier to get people off opioids um, than it is benzos. We have lots of alternatives, um, but benzos are really, really hard on the other end. So just be very thoughtful about prescribing on the front end um, and continuing patients. And I think there was one question. Uh, I think the question about um, uh, Limited prescriptions for benzos have led to people um, buying on the street. And there was a, some articles about fentanyl being used in street benzodiazepines. Yeah, so, so, so I'll say fentanyl is being used in pretty much everything on the street right now. Um, in fact, people who say they're doing heroin, they're probably just doing fentanyl. Um, so, and you know, the, the, the drug cartel manufacturers are very good at, uh, uh, figuring out what to put in their product uh, to get people hooked. So, um, and, and fennel is definitely one of them. So they, uh, yes, yeah, so benzos are definitely getting cut. I, I've seen um, benzos and fentanyl, both even in pot in some cases as well. So there, there's a lot going on to uh, try to get people hooked. Um, you know, in terms of prescribing, it's all about supply and demand, right? If there's a demand, there will be a supply. Um, so whether it's through prescriptions um, or it's through the street, you know, people will look to uh, get what they need uh, and, and their needs met. One last quick question. Benzos are essential for short-term use in acute situation. At what point do you wean patients off of benzos or cut, cut them off? That's the question. Elizabeth, do you want to? I, I had responded in the chat. Um, you know, I think you talk about them being indicated for short-term use at initiation, reminding individuals to use them sort of as that break the glass medication and not using them consistently on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and then just try to limit their use for two to four weeks because we don't know a lot beyond two, the two to four week period. And I will say just the longer they're on. So if, and there's also studies around three months. There are some that go up to three months and clearly at three months that people have developed dependency um, for, for even three at three months, it's, it's pretty clear. So, you know, in order for them to not, again, this is an addiction, this is a physiologic dependence. Um, and the longer they're on it, the, the more that dependence is, is happening, uh, the harder it is that that patient will be able to taper that medication at any point in time, so. Well, thank you both for an excellent presentation and also for your work on the Controlled Substance Task Force. We have uh, more to do, but the, the whole issue of academic detailing and providing uh, you know, solid data and feedback to our 
uh, physicians and prescribers about what's going on in, in our Norton universe is really important. So thank you for your work on that as well.